invite you to the book of Matthew, chapter number two. The book of Matthew, chapter number two. Uh, the main thing that I want to remind you of in Matthew chapter two is uh, how in uh, over and over and over and over uh, through angelic intervention in ministry, the uh, the people, the Christians, Joseph and Mary, and others, the, the wise men, were guided by the Lord. Protected, guided, led, and folks, we have the same promise. Amen. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shouldst go, I will guide thee with my eye. Uh, the method is a little different in that we now have a completed scripture which is adequate to lead us. We now have, uh, which they did too in, in, in a little different <coughs> manner, but the guidance and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, and God even guides in circumstances. And so it, it, I, I want you to remember that. Uh, we begin in uh, verse number 13, the flight into Egypt. There is usually in the Old Testament a double fulfillment in prophecy, near and far. At one point, uh, the Old Testament prophets prophesied of Israel in Egypt. And Israel in the, Old, in the Old Testament is called my son. That has a second fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's read verse 13, 14, and 15. Then we'll talk about it a little bit. And when they were departed, that is the uh, wise men, uh, be, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod. What that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. That would be, that fulfillment of prophecy would be, uh, is Hosea chapter 11, verse number 1. Did you know there is nobody like Matthew who repeatedly makes the statement that the prophecy might be fulfilled which was spoken by? Matthew does that more than anybody. There's a lesson there for us. We need to pray not only daily for the Lord to guide us, but we need to pray daily for the word and will of the Lord to be fulfilled in our lives. The word and the will of the Lord to be fulfilled in our lives. And Jesus himself many times said, I'm going to do this because it was spoken of me by the prophets. The Lord was extremely concerned that that the will of the Father would be accomplished in his life. We should be too. We should be too. Uh, let's walk through this. Let me make some observations. The first one that I want to make is this about the baby Jesus. Even men, women, children, even men who later in adult life have extremities of challenges and problems have a peaceful childhood. <coughs> Most children have a peaceful childhood, are cared for to some degree. The Lord Jesus Christ as a baby did not have a peaceful childhood. I mean within the first year of his life somebody was out to kill him. The sufferings of Jesus did not begin and end at the cross. The sufferings of Jesus began at his birth. As, by the way, was prophesied. 
And when they were departed, the wise men, the old angel of the Lord, appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and, and be thou there until I bring the word again, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. There's nothing hid from God. We do not always know where the danger is. We do not always know where the problems and the difficulties are. We do not always know what other people may be planning that would hurt us. God always knows. God always knows. Nothing hid from God. God knew everything that was going on, and God had a plan to protect the baby Jesus, as God has a plan to protect us. Now, I want you to notice something it says here. Uh, it says, uh, take the young child and his mother. The correctness of the wording there, not Joseph's baby. He would raise him, but it wasn't jo Joseph's baby. Notice, secondly, the order. First the child, then the mother. The Roman Catholic Church has got it backwards. It's the Holy Mother Mary and then the child Jesus. No. After Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph lived and had a normal marriage relationship and there were other children born in that marriage. One of the writers, I'll tell you what, you know there's no perfect writing except the Bible. Amen. We understand that. Uh, one of the uh, folks that I checked on suggested that uh, Joseph had been married before and that all the other children were by Joseph's first marriage. Look, nonsense. There's nothing in, subscri in Scripture to substantiate that other than that after the baby was born, Joseph and Mary had a normal marriage where children were born. So, uh, a very important, just a minor little detail that if you overlook it, you, you probably wouldn't think about it, but with the heresy of some of the uh, religious denominations today, it's really important to bear out it's the young child and then his mother. I talked a little bit about it, I won't repeat this, only to mention it, they were told to flee into Egypt. Uh, the since God made life and God made the world, we understand the natural instinct of self-preservation. Even Jesus said, "When they persecute in one city, flee ye to another." Now. Especially preachers, pastors, when they get in trouble in their church for preaching the truth, God will have to give them wisdom. Stay or leave. Stay or leave. That would have to be a decision between the pastor and the Lord. When persecution comes, uh, do we stay or do we move? God will have to give wisdom at that time. But here, they were told to flee. And notice where they were told to flee. Egypt. The most unlikely, the most unlogical place. Egypt. A place of sin. The world. A place that's always been the enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Egypt stands for everything that, that is against Christianity, yet that's where they were told to flee. By the way, David, the great, great, great grandson of the Lord Jesus Christ, until he came to the throne, he had to hide in a lot of places that were enemies to the Jews and enemies to the camp uh, of the Jewish people and enemies of Christ. God can keep us safe wherever we are. First of all, the whole <clears throat> existence of Christians after they're saved, we're now living in the enemy's campground. Uh, we're no longer 
in a friendly atmosphere. But it doesn't matter where we are. God is there. And God will protect us. And something else from a spiritual standpoint. They were now going to be away from the temple and the Jewish places of worship. <coughs> now we in this country have been very blessed in that we've always been able to get to our places of worship. There are other places in the world where people cannot always get to a place of worship. But remember, even if something were to happen and you cannot get to a place of worship, the God that you worship is always with you. Now, I happen to be able to relate to this story at this point because when I was a young boy in Germany and the Allied forces had decimated the country because of that bad man that was running the country, Hitler, uh, and, and, and there wasn't any place for us to go to church on Sunday. And even if there had been a building, it wasn't safe. So we worship where we could once in a while. And I do mean just once in a while. We would hear about, well, there's going to be a going to be church there Sunday. We would go. But that didn't happen very often. The church literally had to be a home. We have been so blessed and so protected in this country that at least to this point we've not had a problem. And we're very blessed for that. So when they were departed, the holy angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. Now, first of all, God told him where to go. And God said, you stay there until I bring you word. In all of our movings about, it's good to have the clear will of the Lord, the good leadership of the Lord. They say that 70% of the average congregation in America relocates every seven years. 70% every seven years. Uh, we are a mobile society. 70% every seven years. <coughs> I, um, I'm at the age of life, I'm not a night person. Pat and I are not a night people. But we're to the point in our life where at night we want to be home. It's what old people do. Young people never stop. Old people, we like being home at night. Amen, anybody? Thank you. Woo. Don't leave me hanging up here alone. Huh? I said, I'm not old. I'm like being old. Yeah, amen. So um, I, I was just uh, utterly flabbergasted. Friday night, I, I drove one of the buses with the band to Alito, and we went up 287, and then 20 all the way to the Alito exit. Folks, God is my witness. Wall-to-wall -wall cars. Wall-to-wall. -wall, I mean, a solid line both lanes, after we got on 20, most of the time, we could not drive much over 50 miles an hour on the interstate in that bus. It was just absolutely wall-to-wall -wall cars. And I'm thinking, where are all these people going? And yes, most of the football games, because... <coughs> I, I'm sure that going and coming, we passed maybe, or give or take, about 30, 40 buses. So I'm sure it was a, But man, we are a going, moving society. Christians, we don't need to run without purpose. We need to be where God put us, and we need to stay until God tells us to leave and give us directions elsewhere. Now then, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Herod heard from the wise men when they said, Where is he that was born king of the Jews? Man, Herod's radar went up. He was a very wicked king. Very aggressive, mean spirit. 
just a bad, bad ruler. And so he instructed the wise men, well, you go find him, and then you come and tell me where he is, I go worship him also. That's a lie. <clears throat> we need to be a little more discerning when other people talk religiously. Don't take that too far. Uh, I, I want to go worship that church. No, he didn't. He wanted to kill him. Well, of course, God, the Lord, through an angel, warned the wise men what Herod was up to and said, you go home another way. So they did. And finally, Herod found out that he had been deceived and it, it, it infuriated him. So now he is going to go to plan two. And not only kill the baby Jesus, which of course wasn't going to happen, but he killed all the babies from two years old and under in a certain region. Now, how do we mentally lock into such an evil? And of course the answer is we can't. The answer is we can't. But can you imagine such an evil? First of all, let me remind you something I think I said last week. Uh, uh, they say at this point his life is about 70 years old, which is a very old man for that for, for that part of the world, that very old. And uh, the baby Jesus was less than two years old. There wasn't any way in the world that that baby Jesus was ever going to be a threat to that old man. He was going to be dead and long gone. But wickedness will stop at nothing. I mean, you have to say that a man who will do that is pretty much divested of all human dignity and certainly uh, has uh, nothing left in him to value the dignity of life. For some to do that. And, and let me pause to say this. We are a nation that's quickly moving in the direction where we no longer have the dignity of life that we ought to have. Or we wouldn't be killing babies. And we wouldn't be euthanizing old people. And we wouldn't let drunks out on the street who kill people and they might get two or three years in jail. Let me share a little fact with you. Before the USSR, Russia, the conglomerate of communist nations, before that broke up, in, 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 in that communistic bloc, if you killed someone driving a car drunk, you were executed. And if you hurt someone in a car driving drunk, you were sent to prison for life. Well, needless to say, they did not have any, they didn't have much of a problem with people driving drunk like we are. The only thing that stops evil is fear of judgment. I'll say that again. The only thing that stops fear and that stops evil is fear of judgment. Yeah. And we've lost it. Right. We've lost fear of judgment and we have lost sanctity of life. Yep. So here is a, a, an evil old man to maintain his power is willing to slaughter thousands of his little babies. Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. By the way, he didn't wait a week or two. He got up that night and left. Obedience is only obedience if it's done right away. Delayed obedience is no obedience. 
and they were there till the death of Herod, which he died soon after the slaughter of the babies, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, Hosea 11, 1, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Everything that happened in the Lord of life, there were 600 predictions, prophecies, of events of the Lord's life in the Old Testament. And by the time the Lord died, rose, and went back to heaven, there was not one of those that was not fulfilled. The Word of God must always be fulfilled, which, by the way, America needs to pay attention to because the Bible says the nation that sinneth, it shall die. So, one of the sad, sad, sad incidents in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament is beginning in verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. Boy, nothing worse than a mean-spirited ruler. Nothing worse. Was exceeding wroth and so forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, the entire region. We don't know how many thousands, but he slew thousands of babies two years old and under. From two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. These babies, thousands of them, were the first martyrs in the New Testament, were the first martyrs of the Christian religion. For these, the Lord would eventually shed his blood. Nobody has an accurate count of how many, millions literally, of godly men, women, and children, and babies have been slaughtered by evil, evil, satanically inspired men, sinners, exceeding sinners. But here we have the first. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying in uh, Hebrew, that would be Jeremiah 31, 15. In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Interesting that this event took place in the close proximity where Rachel's grave was. And these mothers of these babies that were killed, many of them came from the lineage of Rachel's family line. And again, you have a double fulfillment, the slaughter of so many children in Judaism by the nations round about them and then again here in this place and by the way to happen again in the great tribulation under the antichrist because of christ because of the uh giving of the law and the word of god coming through those people being separated unto god they have always suffered Admittedly, much of their suffering now is because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Only mothers and fathers who've lost a child in death can understand this. This is not something that I can understand. This is not something that most people can understand. 
I know that in my life the most difficult funerals that I have done were babies. And secondly, the most difficult funerals that I have done were teenagers who died in car wrecks. To me, I don't, I don't know about you, Brother Ron, but to me, uh, those have always been the most difficult funerals that I have done. I cannot relate because I have not lost a child to death. It is unnatural when children go before parents. It's unnatural. And so I, I, I cannot relate. But, but there is, a, a ladies are capable of, their emotions are so much better and so much stronger than men. They, uh, uh, they are ca capable of grieving a death that us guys do not understand. Rama, lamentation, weeping, great mourning. Rachel, weeping, and the descendants, weeping for her children. They would not be comforted. Very difficult. Very, 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 very difficult to comfort parents who are losing children to death. It's a great, great mystery of the Word of God. Because they are not means they are no longer in the land of the living. It doesn't mean that they were annihilated in the sense of no longer having an existence. We know better than that. When you compare Scripture with Scripture, man breathes into it. Uh, uh, God breathed into man the, the breath of life, the spirit. That spirit goes back to the Lord at the time of death. They are not simply means they were no longer in, the, in this land of the living. It does not mean that they were annihilated. Very difficult for us to comprehend. What do we think about Friday night? Seven men, or however the meaning of the word, but basically seven attacks over there in Paris. And just cold blood, slaughtered. No hands, it's so much about it, slaughtered. What the count is now right around 130 in Maine, and, uh, uh, about 300 others. I'll tell you what, none of us fully comprehend, which is a good thing, the depth of Satan and the evil of Satan and the depths to what to what man will do if not restrained. I'll, let me say this, I'll probably say this twice so you may get to hear this again at 11 o'clock, I'm not sure. Say what you will about our government. I know that we're rotting apart internally and morally. I understand that. And that will be the death of a nation. But our government, to this point, has done a wonderful job protecting the public. Say what you will. I know some of you are just not going to say anything nice about our government no matter what. But folks, we have stopped in this country dozens and dozens of attacks like, like what happened on Friday night. Now, will that always be the case? I don't think so. <coughs> will that happen here at the rate it's going? Yes. But you have to say, to this point, uh, our exceedingly intricate and sophisticated government technology so far has protected us, for which, obviously, we need to be careful and thankful. So, now they returned from Egypt to Nazareth. But when Herod was dead, ah, Herod, the mean old man, was going to go after that little baby and kill him. Herod's dead, the baby's alive. Hallelujah. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. See, the Lord can speak to you wherever you are. The Lord 
is not limited. Doesn't matter what your situation is or who you are, the Lord can come for you and speak to your heart and give you direction. Saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Egypt, for they are dead who sought the young child's life. By the way, they. Well, I mean, look at the damage Hitler did, and Mussolini did, and Stalin did. Not only were they mean hombres, they had armies at their disposal to do their evil. And so Joseph arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus had reigned in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither like father, like son. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside to go into the parts of Galilee where Philip ruled. Philip was a gentle personality. He was not like the Herods. And so they were instructed to turn aside into Galilee. Why? Well, to be out from the human side, to be out of the uh, 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 shock of danger, but from the divine side, to again fulfill a prophecy, which I've already said Matthew was very meticulous about recording. And he came and dwelt in a city of Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. First of all, God orders our steps. You are where you are. You live where you live. You doing what you're doing because God is ordering your steps. God, you may not understand it, but God has a purpose for where you are. God, you are, you know, we are, whether we ever say anything or not, which we should, of course, when we can, but, but we are a saver of death unto death. We are a saver of life unto life. Our very presence, if they know we're believers and we're spirit-filled. Our very presence, we are an influence. We are the salt. Can you imagine what happened to Stephenville, Texas, if tomorrow there weren't a believer in the town? So you are where you are. You are what you are. You'd be doing what you're doing by the grace of God, by the will of God. And every place that this baby ended up was by God's design. Now we need to talk about this Nazarene thing a little bit. And he came and dwelt in the city of Nazareth. There was, a, there was a city of Nazareth. By the way, the city of Nazareth did not have a good reputation. Nazareth literally meant the slogan that was given on the men of Nazareth was the worthless one. The worthless ones. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Remember? The worthless ones. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, uh, the Lord, uh, you know, in his first coming, everything about his life, he humbled himself. Everything about his life was totally contrary to what people would do, that the many gathered around him, the places he lived, the people he won, was always, if I could say this, the rejects of society. And so he lived where he did because it was in keeping with his first ministry, a humble ministry that, that ended in a death. It will be the next coming that will be the glorification of him and us before honor is humility. And everything in the Lord's life and every place he went was in keeping with that. Now, 
a theology point. The Lord, strictly speaking, never was a Nazarite. A Nazarite was someone that was totally dedicated, dedicated to, to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not drink wine, which the Lord did. They did not cut their hair, which the Lord did. They did not touch dead bodies, which the Lord did. So, in, 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 in the strictest sense, he was not a Nazarite, he was a Nazarene, because of the sin he was from. But in his lifestyle, in his ministry, he would have been the ultimate <coughs> Nazarite, had he been one in the sense that the Bible fulfills. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Psalms 37, 23, or 4. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You see that in the life of the Lord. And, and, and you see that in the life of believers and in the life of the churches. And we need to find comfort that God knows us as intimately as he knew his own son, Jesus Christ, and he is watching over us like he did him. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's stop there.